Okay, so we're up here, we're installing the LETO or Leto Eco Series by Senville Mini Split. This is the two ton unit or a 24,000 BTUs. So we're gonna be doing, this is for the fruiting room for my mushroom farm. Uh, and we're in a little tiny preconditioning room. It's basically where the air gets cooled down for the fruiting room. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna flip the unit on its back. You're gonna pull off the mounting bracket. It just has little tabs, little plastic tabs on what's the bottom of the unit once it's hung, okay? So basically this is what's gonna mount up to the wall. This unit's gonna get mounted pretty high up on the wall. If you were in a, in a room, it would be mounted high, but here we're limited, so it's actually gonna be just in the middle kind of. Um, you have to make sure you have enough room to where you can swing the unit down because it hangs off these hooks and then it kind of clips into place. So I actually want this unit as far left as possible because I want a room over there for other stuff, for intake stuff. So I'm gonna put this about right here, okay? And I'm lucky I don't have to find studs. If you were, I guess a drywall room, you're gonna wanna search out the studs and, and make sure you're grabbing all the studs. But I have, this is a metal building that I'm in and then the walls have plywood on them. So I can just send it anywhere pretty much. That's pretty level. So I'm gonna send a couple screws in. This is not very heavy. This unit maybe weighs 20 pounds, 30 pounds, something like that. Not very heavy at all. Double check that because it did move. Yeah, I'm gonna adjust that. I don't believe it's super important to have it level, but any job worth doing is worth doing right. And uh, you want it to be, I guess it is because the condensate, I take that back, you do want it pretty damn level because there's condensate that will collect on the coils in here from the moisture in the room. And if you don't have it leveled correctly, the condensate will not drain correctly. And then you might run into dripping in the room. Okay, I'm gonna do one or two more and call it a day. In the corners. All right, so now what you need to do is, depending on how you're gonna be hooking this up, if you're gonna say have they have this over here where you can remove it. So if you're gonna have it to where the pipes are gonna run a little bit indoors and then go outside, you would take this and, and break this off and send it out that way. I'm actually going through the back wall. My condenser is right outside. It's actually right over to the left a little bit. Um, so what I need to do is take these lines. Here's the two, the, um, the two lines that are coming back from the condenser. And I'm gonna gently rotate them, okay. And these are actually like flex lines, like they're, they're designed to be moved, but you still got to be very gentle with them. And I'm purposely keeping it at an angle upwards because that's how I'm going to drill the holes. All right. And the reason for that is your condensate line. You want your condensate line to drain off correctly. Okay. But these are rigid. All right. So that is good. Here's your condensate line right there. That's where the, the condensate runs through your water is going to drip through that and you want it going upwards because then when it flips it's going to be going downwards. So now we're going to measure this from where that tab is, okay, in the middle of that tab to the center of all of this, which is, wait, where's the tab? Right there. Yeah, so I'm going to line up the center of this tab, use that as a marking point. It's going to be six inches over. And then the center of that is gonna be about uh, an inch and three quarters down. So I'm gonna mark that on the wall. Six inches over. Okay. And then what I say? 
that's an in inch and three quarters up from the bottom of the bracket so it'll be like right around here and this isn't really an exact thing it just has to be close enough to where everything will fit through i'm using like a three inch hole saw i think or two and a half i think it calls for a slightly less this is a three inch i think it calls for like a 2.6 or something like that but this works just a little bit more to fill back when you're done so first i just have a layer of foam that i gotta get through okay Uh, it's wood and I'm going to angle this one down a little bit. Okay. And then I got insulation. So this part I'm actually going to use a um, a long drill bit. And I'm going to mark the center of it. Making sure that I'm at least a good inch down through all this insulation. And then I will go on the outside and drill the hole through. Okay, so this is one thing that I made a mistake of when I was hanging the first unit. Um, you want to make sure that you go in and grab your wires from the other box. So this box, this comes in a box with an indoor unit, the outdoor unit comes in a box, and there's the installation package. This comes with the installation package. You're going to find the end, and what this is, this is what sends power from the outside unit, which is getting power from your disconnect, and it powers this unit. So you want to find the end that has the, the little straight ones on it, not, not the, uh, the forked prongs. Because this is going to go into the panel in there. And what you're going to do is you're going to run it up. You should see a hole that it's going to go through. And then you're going to pop your top panel open, your front panel. Okay, take this tape off. Because you want to top, uh, open it up. And remove the um, there's like an access panel on the right hand side okay so there's this access panel right here you're gonna want to get in there and darn it I don't have a screwdriver you're gonna want to pry at it and get it out and then from there you can pull your wires through there we go okay Try not to break anything. Ugh. As I break it. No, we're good. Okay. So, now that that's off, well, this one's actually a little bit different. This one has a secondary panel covering. The other units don't have this. So, I, I previous to this video, I already installed a one ton unit and a ton and a half unit. So,. I kind of know what I'm doing, but I'm definitely not a professional. Okay, so I had this one, the two-ton unit, you have to remove this extra panel, which isn't on the other ones, and then it exposes where you connect all your wires, a little like bus terminal. All right. Hey, Brandon, I'm gonna need you outside in like 30 seconds. What you're doing is pulling through these, uh, I'm gonna put it through here. Just take note of this one. It likes to get caught up. All right, and don't pull at anything. Like, kind of just feed it through gently. So, yeah, you're going to have to have somebody go outside and give them those instructions, essentially. Um, so, we have this in here. That's fine. That's good enough for, for starters. What you're going to feed through first is the 10 feet or so of wire. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to line up all this. It actually helps if you have some tape and you tape it together, but I'm not thinking ahead. All right, pull it. Pull the wire. Oh. Stop. Okay, so now I'm going to line it all up. Put it back in the sheathing back in the insulation. Okay. Pull it! Oh, shit, he pulled the wire through. Mm. 
and I probably should have clamped it. There is a clamp in there that holds it in place. There's a little bar in here you can unscrew and then clamp down the wire onto it. Okay. All right, go ahead, pull it. All right, that's good. So now all you do is you find your top hanger. Hang it on your top hangers. I got some foam in the way it looks like. And then once you have your top set, you just clip the bottom in. All right, we're set there. We're set there. And then just make sure that the bottom is actually clipped on. You should, you hear that clip. And then we're good. So from there, you go ahead and open it up and you just wire these guys up. So one, two, and three, it really honestly doesn't matter which order you do the colors in. All that matters is that the one, two, and three inside match the one, two, and three outside because that's all that matters. <laughs> it's not like you're, you're ground, you're neutral, you're hot. It's, uh, it, who knows, I don't know. They don't even tell you in the damn instructions. They just say, make sure that they match. So I usually do red, black, and white. And with these fittings, make sure that they are, the, ch the, ch the C channel kind of thing is facing you. You'll see it when you're working on it. There's like a little crimp connection with a little kind of thing like this on the end. Make sure it's facing you. And it's very hot up here. That's why we need an air conditioner. So if I'm sweating and talking fast, that's why. All right, so I got it up in there. Let's tighten it down. Red. Do red, black, and white. One, two, and three. And then green is your ground, which is that funny looking symbol, which is showing earth ground all the way on the right. Okay. I hope you guys like my socks. Everyone always gives me great comments on them. These are my Air Force socks. And I rock them at work all day. So kind of some cool news today. I've been doing material control for a very long time, which is basically just ordering parts for like two and a half, three years. And today I got put in charge of refueling and fire truck maintenance. So I'm pretty excited about that. All right, so I'm gonna pull off this thing that I probably should have done before. It's a little uh, like wire clamp, okay? Pull that off, and then I'm gonna pull it out where the rubber is being clamped. And it looks like they have a bunch of different sizes for, I guess, different different size kits or whatever, but we're gonna find the one that fits this one, which looks like it's the far left. Yeah, it's the far left. And then that that's gonna hold this wire so it doesn't get pulled through again like it did before when I go to wire it up on the outside. So that pretty much, yeah, that completes the in interior install. Um, the next time I'm gonna be in here, I'm gonna be using the remote and uh, pressing the on button. And these units are really easy to install. I, I bought these opposed to the Mr. Cool units, which are, they claim that they're like, you know, DIY, whatever, but it didn't really seem that much of a difference. The only difference was the Mr. Cool units, I don't think need a, uh, they don't need a vacuum pump, but they were also like $400 more and a vacuum pump costs like $50. Or you can actually do this. I, I did it because my vacuum pump crapped out on me. I broke some pieces of it. Um, you can go to AutoZone and you can rent one for free and then you just return it. They charge you like, they'll put 200 on your card, but then when you return it, you get all the money back. So yeah, you don't need to have the equipment just use what's available locally. And the one thing you may have to buy is gauges because the gauges that they had at, at AutoZone did not, or not AutoZone, it was O'Reilly's. They were not correct. They were more for vehicles. 
So I had to go and buy a set of like $30 gauges and some adapters for like 10 or $20. And I'll put, I'll put a link in the description below for all of this stuff and all the parts and tools that I used. So that's wired up, red, black, white. That's all you gotta remember for when you go outside and tuck all this stuff in. And that's pretty much it. If you were gonna be doing a cool bot or whatever, you'd be messing around with this guy. This is your room temperature sensor. So that's where you would hack into it. You don't necessarily have to even do a cool bot. You can just use a ink bird temperature controller and put a little heater, like a little betta fish or a light bulb or uh, a night light on that to trick the air conditioner to think that the room is hotter and then it'll run the air conditioner longer. So depending on how cool this keeps my fruiting room, I might do that. I might be running this off of an ink bird hacked onto it. And an Inkbird talking about a plug and play Inkbird temperature controller. So okay, that's pretty much it for the in inside unit. Here's your filters. They pop up, they slide out, pretty basic. There's your cooling fins, your evaporator. Okay, and that's pretty much it. All right, so we're outside right now. We're gonna start installing. First, I'm gonna go over all the tools that I'm gonna be using today and all the parts you're gonna need. First off, to hook up the electrical, you're gonna to wanna to have a flex wire. Um, this is the nylon uh, liquid type uh, flexible wire. So this is gonna go from your disconnect up to your unit, um, supplying the main power from your, from your disconnect to the actual compressor. And then you're gonna to wanna to have an elbow and a straight fitting. A straight fitting goes up on the unit. The elbow goes down on the disconnect to go up to the disconnect or down to the disconnect. Depends on the situation that you're in. Um, also, you're gonna want some wire strippers. You're gonna need a 3 16ths, I believe, um, Allen. And that's gonna be for releasing your refrigerant. Phillips screwdriver, some wrenches. I also have some nylog blue. That's um, a sealant that goes on your flare fittings. It's optional. And then you're gonna need an adapter for you're gonna need this adapter to hook up your gauges to the um, whatever the R R four ten A connections. So, because this is for R one thirty four, um, so you need this adapter, and then you need a set of uh, gauges, and then a vacuum pump. So this vacuum pump I actually rented from AutoZone or O'Reilly's. It was free. You rent it. It's like a hundred dollar deposit or two hundred dollar deposit, and then when you you bring it back, it's free. Um, so yeah, that's all the tools that you're going to be needing for today. Okay, so one of the first things I'm going to do is get my um, line to length. So I'm actually going to grab the fittings too. And um, I'm going to get this cut first. Figure out where it's going to go. It's going to have the straight one right there on the back side. And then on the, the side of the disconnect, this one's gonna be pointing upwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and attach these. The, the collar unscrews, that goes on. Let me actually cut this flush because this is not a straight cut from the factory. Okay, and this is just the nylon one. They do have one that's um, like metal. It looks just like this, but there's metal inside and it costs like twice as much. So I'm just gonna disconnect that collar, put the collar on, push this on all the way, and then screw down that collar. Okay. So this guy, we're gonna take off this cover plate, and it's gonna go in, in one of these black holes. So there's actually three screws holding in this top cover plate. And you want to leave that bottom screw in because that's where, that's what holds that plate up so that you can wire everything on. Now I might pull it down if I'm having issues with, if I want to pull the wire through with that, if I want to pull the actual wire through the conduit like that um, on the ground and then put it back up. But when you're actually wiring it up, you're going to put this bottom screw in with just that bottom plate so you can access everything. Put all these screws in there, put that up top. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to put this on the, yeah, we'll put it on the front side actually. And the little guy will go on the back side. Okay. So 
I'm going to take that metal piece, the metal screw, or metal nut, unscrew that. And there is a right way and a wrong way. You want to have it so that the teeth are facing down. Okay, put it up there. So now we can find our length. Okay, just loosely screw that up. Let's have it to where it goes like this. Comes down. All right, and then this guy goes right there. So we're cutting it right there. All right. Where did I put it? In my pocket. Once again, unscrew the collar or the lock nut, I guess is the correct name. Push it on all the way. Make sure it's pointing the right direction and then screw it down. So this disconnect, um, I had professionally wired by an electrician and he also wired up the other end. It's caulked around the sides. So that, that way moisture doesn't get in there. And knock it, and knock out. Okay. And I verify that the breaker is dead before I started this. Make sure this is the right length. Yeah, it's good enough. Rather have a little bit of slack than not enough. Let's see if I can pull the wires through. I think I'm actually going to remove this for pulling the wires. So I got three wires here. So I got three wires here. Um, you're gonna have your your hot, your neutral, and then your ground. Yeah, it's going. If you're doing a longer run, you might wanna use some fishing, uh, like a puller, fishing wire, not fishing wire, but a fisher. I don't know what the correct name is. A rigid metal wire you push through and then hook onto your wires and pull them through okay so here's the connections up on the top we're going to start off with our ground so you want to pull that out a little bit extra because it's going to have to wrap around that and then your line one and line two are going to be your black and your red are going to go right there so this ground is actually technically a green but i didn't i, I didn't have any green and i couldn't find any green wire available so i'm just going to use white and i'm going to flag it later with a tape of uh of green so let me wire that up and I'll get right back. Okay, so that's what it should look like when you wire all your heavy gauge wires. So your ground is gonna be stripped back about an inch and then looped around your ground pole. And then you have your two lines, your line one, line two, or if you're doing 120 volt, this is a 240 volt unit. If it's a 120 volt unit, you'll have your neutral and your hot line. So that's, that's the power supplied to the unit. And now I'm gonna go ahead and pull over the wire that was coming out that I fished through the with the, the head unit the inside unit I'm going to grab that wire which actually goes to right here and I'm going to wire that up and you can see this one actually has it has the connections on it now on the other ones you can see it's a lot shorter of a run from the um, the mini split to the actual um, head unit but this one is pretty far because the way that we set it up, I don't really know why. I guess it was just where I put, I put this in the fruiting room and then that was over on the preconditioning room, which is a little bit over more. But anyways, what I'm getting at is if you do cut these, if you do shorten the line, make sure you put the correct connections on it, put the forked connections on it. You can see them there. So um, yeah, definitely go to like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever the heck, order them online and get the correct and the, make sure they're sized correctly as well. Don't have forks that are too big or forks that are too small or anything like that. So let me go ahead and wire these up. This is gonna go through this connection. I'm gonna use a uh, clamp holder on it, a uh, wire clamp on it to hold it in place. And then uh, I'm gonna just wire these up in the same order. I think it's uh, 
red, black, and white is line one, two, three. So uh, I'll go inside and double check before I do that. And the ground goes to that ground screw over there. So this is what it should look like when you're done wiring the unit. Um, you have your one and two and three wires that run into the indoor unit. And then you have your two lines and then your two grounds. So I'm going to go ahead and put the little cable clamp that goes on here. There's two little bolt, two little screws and, and a little clamp bridge that goes over it. And then we're going to, we're going to tie this all up and put the cover plate back on. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and wire up the, into the box, into the disconnect box. So we have our elbow. We're going to shove our elbow over the wire. And the reason why you want to run a disconnect is, or we actually want to do the nut first. The reason why you do a disconnect is that if you're ever maintaining it, it well, it's code for one. And the reason why it's code is that if you're ever out here maintaining it, you have to have like direct line of sight of a disconnect. Like let's say if somebody's out here working on it, you don't realize it and the breaker's inside and they see that a breaker's off and they go and turn a breaker on, um, they can electrocute you or cause a fire or whatever. So. That's the purpose of having a disconnect out here and it's secondary uh, safety in case of because you have the fuses on there on here So if something doesn't happen with the breaker for whatever reason then the fuse will trip or the fuse will blow rather Okay, we're gonna pull it through the side over here take our nut off Whenever you're doing wiring it's always better to cut a little bit long and give yourself a little bit more slack I can't tell you how many times I've I've cut a wire and then been like, oh shoot, if I only had another inch or two, I could do what I needed to. So yeah, you always cut tails a little bit long and then trim, trim afterwards. Okay, so we're gonna tighten that nut down. A little pointer, a little uh, fun fact, if you're ever doing a disconnect box like this or any kind of sub, this is essentially a sub panel box in a way, because it does have uh, breakers and a disconnect. But um, yeah, with sub panels, when you're not in your main panel, you never connect the white to the ground. Normally white and ground are bound together in your primary box and your main box, but never in a secondary box. So we're, where you would use that bus bar to tie your whites and your grounds together, normally, we're not gonna do that. And the reason why is um, it's not safe. It, it, it's something to where it can make a circuit, it can complete a circuit outside of the box where you don't want that to happen. Um, okay, so. This white is our ground. Okay, so I'm gonna take it, bend it up to where it's gonna be, give it a little bit of extra, cut it. And then it's our line one and line two. And I'm gonna cut them a little bit long so they can extend up through where they need to go. Cause that's fine, there's, there's nothing above it. They can extend a whole inch above it, it would be fine. Not that I'm going to, but they could. So we're gonna strip these back about three quarters of an inch, not even half an inch. Strip back the ground. Okay. Start off with the ground since it's in the back and kind of buried. You wanna be able to get at it. All right. And I can't tell you how much this tool, tool belt has saved me in time. This is the first, um, building this mushroom farm is the first time that I really was doing this much construction. And I was the only one who had a tool, tool belt, but I could tell that I could work a lot quicker. I probably almost should have, I should have bought my guys tool belts realistically. Um, when my cousin Max came, he, he had a tool belt. But having all the tools at your side, wherever you go, um, it really saves you time and you get to a point where, especially with screws, where you have a pocket full of screws and you're just not even looking. You just grab a screw, go, grab a screw, go. Or with wire nuts, same thing with electrical. Grab a wire nut, wire it up. Um, you can do jobs a lot quicker with the right tools. All right, let's get that up in there. Okay. Crank, and then you can crank these down pretty tight. You're not gonna strip them, they're, they're pretty heavy lugs. Okay, and the final one. All right, you go up there. And that completes the wiring. So now, 
if I wanted to, I can go indoors and, and turn it on, but that's kind of makes no sense because I got to do the refrigerant. So that's the next step. I'm going to show you guys how to how to purge the lines right now. The compressor outdoors is charged. It already has exactly how much refrigerant you're going to need. The indoor unit is charged with air. It's probably nitrogen, I'm willing to bet. And they have caps on it. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to release those caps and hook up your lines, pull a vacuum, and then release the charge. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the cover plate. Then we're gonna remove our Allen charge port holes. I don't know what the, or the caps rather. So these are where you're gonna release. There's actually a needle valve inside of there. And you're gonna release the Freon by backing off a screw in here, but later on. And then we're gonna open up our vacuum port. This is our low side access port where you would service the unit, pull a vacuum on it, charge it, whatever you're doing. In this case, we're gonna be pulling a vacuum on it. So right now, these valves are shut. The Allen valves are shut, holding everything. Imagine that this is, well, this is a tank. So this is a tank and the valves are shut. So we're gonna hook up the lines to it that are exposed to air and moisture and, and oxygen and all that. And, um, we're gonna release the air out of that, which is pressurized right now just with, with nitrogen. And we need to get all that moisture and oxygen out of there because we only want Freon on the system. So what we're gonna do is, with these valves shut, we're gonna pull a vacuum once we hook up all the lines, pull a vacuum on these lines and the head unit, the indoor unit. So by doing that, pulling the vacuum is gonna remo remove all the oxygen, remove all the moisture. If there's any water in there, it'll boil it off. And um, that's why you want to pull at least a half hour of a vacuum when, whenever you're doing a refrigerant re recovery. Okay, so we have these lines here and it looks like they have one side that is kind of twisted uh, to make it a little bit easier to bend. And in my case, I'm gonna put that one over here because I'm gonna do a bigger bend over here. I'm gonna have that side, the rigid lines coming out of the back of the head unit do the bending because they have the same thing on the ones coming out of the back side of the head unit. Now, not all of them have this. This is actually the first one that I ran into that had this. The ones that I did for the, um, the smaller units did not have this. Dust caps, of course they don't want to remove. Okay, so we're gonna actually put a little bit of nylog on here. Again, this is optional. You just need a little bit of it on the face of the flange. There's just extra reassurance that it's gonna seal up. Brass is pretty soft and usually it does a good job of sealing up on its own, but this was one of those recommended buys on Amazon. I was like, heck the heck, why not? And it was only like $7 or $6 for that little tube and I've already used it on three units. So, and there's, I probably used like one one hundredth of the bottle. So I'll be good for a while on that stuff. So yeah, we're gonna put the flares on, make sure that everything's straight. Get both of them started before you crank either one of them down. As with any hardware, you don't want to fight with it. Okay. And you're definitely going to want to um, insulate these because on the units that I already have running that they're not insulated on, they are sweating heavily, which means that you're condensing water on it, or yeah, the water is condensing on it, which means that air is cooling on it, which means that you're losing efficiency. Now, how much efficiency? Probably not a whole lot, but every little bit counts. Um, 
So yeah, what I did was I took some of the scraps from the ones that I cut down of this tubing and I made little caps that went on, then I taped it on. And this does not want to get started for whatever reason. There it goes. Okay. We're on there. Grab my wrench, press a wrench, and snug it down nice and tight. Now you don't have to go too super crazy with these, you just have to get them nice and snug. They're brass, so they kind of squish. And one thing with these brass flare fittings, you gotta watch out, sometimes it'll grab the hose and it'll twist the hose. And if you're not paying attention, you can actually break your hose. Especially if you're working on an older unit, if you're like, say, reinstalling an older unit and take, or taking apart an older unit, that the lines might be a little bit seized on. You want to see like that one twisted a little bit. You gotta make sure that it's not twisting the pipe too much to where it'll shear it off. Okay, so now we have our two lines. This is our uh, high side line, this is our low side line. So this is our pressure in, this is our pressure out or reduced pressure out. The reason why the high pressure is smaller is because it's liquid. A um, little bit of 101 on an air conditioner. So the whole, the whole thing works on evaporation. So what's happening is your compressor is compressing a gas into a liquid. And then when the liquid gets released inside, it releases, it makes it cool um, to where it, it'll transfer the heat to outside is what happens. So there's a lot of people are confused and they think that air conditioners move air, like from inside to outside, they do not. They move refrigerant, they move temperature, they move heat or cold, because this one actually is a, um, it's a two in one. So you wanna be very careful when bending these so you don't want to kink them. You want to make sure they have a nice radius to them. Bend them all the way along. Don't just bend them in one spot. Okay. And with the excess, I coiled it around the bracketry. So there's, there's a loop that goes around the bracket. And that's if you're not going to trim it. You just coil the excess around the hanger bracket. So I want to kind of work quickly around this because this is pre-charged with nitrogen. And it's very humid right now. That's why I'm sweating so much. I don't know if you can see that, but I'm sweating my butt off. And um, yeah, we want to make sure that we're doing this as quickly as possible. And that'll help with making sure that there's no moisture or air in the system. So we're going to disconnect this guy and it's going to be, you're going to want glasses for this and for the rest of the operation because we're going to be dealing with compressed gases. Wear your PPE. All right. So we're gonna unscrew that. It's a little bit hard to unscrew because it's under pressure and you're gonna hear it going. While that's going, I'm gonna go grab the nut log. So some people say that you don't really have to pull a vacuum on these things. I've, I've heard that one guy did this and just released the air and hooked it up. I'm sure that works, but in the long run, you know, five, 10 years down the road, um, you're letting moisture in the system, which is not good. And you're letting oxygen in the system and you're gonna have corrosion, more corrosion than if you do it the right way. And when you're spending, like this unit was I think $1,400 or $1,300, when you're spending that much, uh, you know, how much is a $100 kit to do it right? You can buy the, the pump. If you want to buy and keep a pump, I think you can buy a whole kit for like 100 or 130 bucks off Amazon. All right, so we want to disconnect that and quickly reconnect it, trying not to let all the outside air in. Okay. Now this fitting, you got to be careful. The rigid side, the side coming from the head unit, from the indoor unit, you do not want to spin that side because you will shear it off. It is not a swivel head. It is a, a soldered on fitting. Okay, we're gonna put a little bit of nylog on this once more on the flare.
Okay. And once you disconnect the first one, it's going to not have pressure anymore. The, the, these lines are connected on the inside through your, your coils. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Now, one thing that I noticed, we pulled this through the other day. You see this line? This is your conden uh, condensate line. This is wrong. I actually have to wiggle this around to the bottom. Uh, I foamed this in place in a hectic storm last night. It started raining literally buckets. Um, and there was water flowing into all of these units where I installed them. I never finished sealing them up so i came out while it was pouring rain in my poncho and sealed them up so lesson learned is when you finish doing this make sure you foam it up right away because you never know when the weather's going to change and you're going to have a torrential downpour especially in kansas where the weather changes every day and it rains almost every week and when it rains it pours here it's it's definitely not el paso it's a, it's a lot different than el paso great farming weather though as long as your property isn't flooding which I'm not, I'm up on a hill. Not quite a hill, but just, it's a slight hill. Enough of a hill to where I'm not flooding. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and tighten this down. All right, now we wanna leave these exposed. We don't wanna wrap them up right away. We wanna have them exposed so that we can adjust them and check them if they're leaking. So now we're all hooked up and we're ready to pull a vacuum. Okay, so this is just a cheap gauge set from, from eBay or Amazon actually. If you check the link below, I'll put a link for all this stuff, including the units that I use. Um, it was like $35, something like that. One thing I learned from doing the last sets is do not tighten these down too much. They were leaking on me or I thought they were leaking on me, so I snugged them down really tight like using pliers, do not do that. These, uh, these little washers are very uh, soft and you will crush them. So we're gonna use this one as a vacuum line, the yellow one as a vacuum line. The blue one's gonna be your low pressure. All right, and we're gonna hook it on right here. And we're just gonna snug it up nice and finger tight, no more. Okay, so now we're gonna hook up the vacuum pump. The yellow line is gonna go here. You make sure that your other top one is plugged, otherwise it's not gonna pull a vacuum. Now this is a single stage pump. I was only able to get like 27 inches of gravity, or not gravity, inches, I'm thinking of brewing, uh, inches of mercury. So you really wanna pull 30, but if you're pulling less than that, just let it go a little bit longer. Uh, I think without a double stage pump, which are about 160 to plus dollars, I don't think you're gonna pull full, a full 30 inches, but honestly 25 inches or 27 inches is more than enough. So we're gonna make sure that our lines are tight, finger tight, not super tight, and we're gonna pull a vacuum. So plug it in. And you should hear the noise change as it pulls a vacuum. All right, we're gonna open up. So let's pull in a vacuum. You heard for a second, you can hear the pump going. Okay, so right now the vacuum is just on the line. We're gonna go ahead and open up. Make sure the, the high side is closed. We're gonna open up the low side. You can hear the pump pulling the vacuum now. Okay. And you'll hear the pump as it pulls that full vacuum. It'll kind of stop pumping almost. Like it'll sound like it's not running, but it, it takes a, a couple minutes. So we're pulling a 27 inches right now, 28 inches almost. 
we might actually get a full 30. That last set, gauge set, might have been bad. We're pulling 29 inches. So you're just looking here. You're looking at, the, this one's not working right now. It's disconnected. We're pulling 29, we're pulling almost 30 inches. Almost 30 inches. And you can hear the pump. You don't hear that oil anymore. You don't hear it really working hard anymore. The reason why is it's not really moving air. It already pulled that full vacuum. And now that motor is just running, not really moving anything. We're moving very little. And that's good. That means that you don't have a leak. If it was to keep making that noise, that like that oil sloshing, sucking through the motor noise, then that means you probably have a leak. And we'll do a quick check. So we're gonna go ahead and shut this off. So that's gonna isolate the system. And it's holding steady. But we're gonna go ahead and let it run for another 20 or 30 minutes and I'll come back to it. Just to make sure that all the moisture is sucked out of the system and that we don't have any issues. Okay, so we've been pulling a vacuum for about 30, 40 minutes now. We're gonna go ahead and shut off the pump. But before you shut off the pump, you're gonna shut off the supply to the pump. So you're gonna shut that guy off. And then shut off the pump. And then you're gonna wait. You're gonna wait 30 to 40 minutes, make sure that there's no leaks. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, we can actually move this pump out of the way for one. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and relieve the vacuum and let some pressure get in there. So we're gonna go to the high side, which is the bottom one with the Allen key. And we're gonna give it a quarter turn and we're gonna look at the gauges. I don't think, yeah, I can get them in frame. Let me see. Now that the pump is unhooked. So we got the gauges here. Hopefully that's in frame. And I'm gonna give it a turn. And we're gonna bring it up to 60 PSI and then stop it. It actually went to 70 something. All right, and now what you do is give a little soapy water. Okay, so now that we have checked the pressure, we're, st we're actually a little bit higher now. We're at 82, which means just the refrigerant has expanded. It was liquid and, and it expanded. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna unhook our low side, okay? And there's a, a Schrader valve in there. So as you unscrew it, it's gonna relieve a little bit of gas. You wanna make sure you do this before you fully charge the system. Otherwise, you're gonna have three or 400 PSI blowing at that and you're gonna lose a lot more refrigerant. So. We're gonna go ahead and relief, relieve all the system pressure, okay? And back this all the way out till it stops. So you don't have to crank at it when it stops, just come to a gentle stop. All right, make sure you do both of these too because there's one on your low side as well. All right. And then you want to make sure you put the caps back on too, because sometimes these fittings will leak. So by putting a cap on it, it will stop that from happening. So I'm going to go ahead and put the caps on these. Uh, I'm going to pull the insulation over it and then, and then put the cover plate back on. So this is a perfect reason why you want to put the soap on there. Just as I cut that, the camera off, the, this one started hissing and the soap made it audible. If it wasn't for the soap, I probably would have never heard it. This fitting was just the slightest bit, not tight enough. So I went ahead and backed it off and then tightened it back up again. And now it's sealed up, but it held the pressure. It checked the leak test, but when it came to putting 400 PSI on it, it leaked. So definitely put the soap on there and double check after you charge the system. Okay, so quick pointer on the weather wrapping. The very beginning has a little bit of glue on it so you want to get that started okay and then give it a wrap or two but you'll notice quickly that it's wrapping or it's unraveling the wrong way so what you do is you give it a couple wraps to get started and then roll the the roll over so it rolls off as you rotate around it and that'll save you a little bit of headache and it's a little bit smoother 
And you definitely want to use this stuff. This should be UV resistant. That's the whole idea to where the, the foam won't fall apart. So here is the finished running unit. And you could hear it. Well, maybe you can't hear, but it is running. That's all the noise that it makes. And I still have to foam that. I'm gonna, I actually had some moisture get in there, so I'm gonna let it vent out for a little bit. But I'm gonna great stuff insulation it with the, the foam. And then once that's secured, I'm gonna hack away at it and then put a nice layer of exterior grade, like silicone sealant, so that way it doesn't degrade the, um, the great stuff is okay, but it breaks down over time. It kind of gets chalky, so I'm gonna make sure that it's really sealed up well. And I'm gonna do that to all of them. Okay, so now we're back upstairs. When you turn on the breaker, you should hear a beep, but nothing turns on, and then you bust out the remote, and you are in business. Some quick tips. Um, this has a turbo feature, so if it's, let's say you, you know, have it set a little bit high, um, and you want it to come down quickly, so you want to get it to 73 quickly, or 72 quickly, and then you hit turbo, it'll say on, and the fans go full speed and it pumps out more CFMs. Now with, um, on normal mode, it's, it's dead quiet. You can't even hear it running. And you actually have a 30 degree drop through the fins. So if it's 70 in the room, um, it's gonna be about 40 degrees, 50 degrees, uh, for, around 40 degrees coming out. So yeah, it's, uh, these are pretty nice units. The outside part is dead quiet as well. I was really expecting some kind of, you know, boom, like humming and vibrating, but there's really none of that. So, well, hopefully, hopefully you liked this video. And um, I know it was a little bit long, but I wanted to go through all the different steps on how to get a mini split up and running. It's not very difficult. It does take a little bit of time. It takes a couple specialty tools, but nothing really that expensive compared to the bills that you could pay if you do have a professional come out and do it. Uh, that being said, if you have any doubts on how to do any of this stuff, hire a professional. With electrical work, make sure it's done correctly um, to code. Uh, you can easily burn down a building if you don't wire things correctly. So, well, hope you like this. Make sure you give it a thumbs up. Check out MyersMushrooms.com for mushroom cultivation supplies and equipment. And check out Kit.com slash MyersMushrooms for this unit as well as the other units that I used and the tools that I used. I'll put a, a link in the description below of all the equipment that I used and the equipment that I installed as well. So, all right, have a good one. Keep on mushrooming.